Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming. And I, I just want to give a shout out to Sue Ellen and to everyone who has made the last two and a half days come together. It's been just terrific, and uh, it's just a great pleasure to be here and to be introducing Erica Armstrong, Armstrong Dunbar, who will discuss her new book, Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave, Ona Judd. Never Caught is one of the most illuminating and beautifully crafted books that I've read in recent years, as well as a work of great historical significance. Erica Armstrong Dunbar is Charles and Mary Beard Professor of History at Rutgers University, and most recently was Professor of History at the University of Delaware. Since 2011, she has served as the inaugural director of the program in African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia, which is dedicated to supporting young scholars, advancing the scholarship in this field, and also in fostering public discussion. Erica grew up in Philadelphia and received her BA from the University of Pennsylvania. One of her professors is here, Evelyn Higginbotham, and her PhD from Columbia University. She has a prominent place among a small and pioneering group of scholars who study the lives of, quote, in her words, women of African descent who called, called America their home in the 18th and 19th centuries. Her first book, A Fragile Freedom, African American Women and Emancipation in the Antebellum City, chronicles the lives of African American women in the urban north during the early years of the Republic. The book focuses on Philadelphia, but explores uh, p uh, parallel developments in Boston and New York. Her book reveals the pivotal role of enslaved and free African American women in nurturing what George Washington, and I think he said this, I remember this from your book, described as the contagion of black freedom in the decades leading up to the Civil War. Never Caught is a brilliant work of historical sleuthing, which recovers the amazing story of Ona Judge. In securing Ona Judge's place in history, uh, Erica has further underscored the formative role of black women in the emancipation process. At the same time, her textured rendering of Judge and her times provides an intimate look at George Washington as a slaveholder and the contradictions, compromises, and freedom struggles that have been at the core of the American experiment since the nation's founding. Never Caught has advanced the task that Nathan Huggins summoned American, histories to, American historians to nearly 30 years ago, and that is to face and illuminate the deforming mirror of truth. Please join me in welcoming Professor Erica Armstrong Dunbar. Good afternoon. Okay, wake up, everybody. <laughs> I know it's the, towards the end of the day, but we're not there yet. Um, thank you, Patricia, for a great introduction. And to Sue Ellen and everyone involved, all the volunteers uh, involved with the book festival. This is my first time here, um, and I'm certain we'll be back because um, it's just an opportunity to interact with great writers and great readers. Um, so thank you uh, for having me. What I'm going to do today is to talk a little bit about how I came to writing um, Never Caught. Uh, and as Patricia said, this is my second book. Um, and I have some people in the audience here who, you know, are completely responsible for Never Caught. Um, and that, of course, is my editor, Don Davis, who everyone knows here in Martha's Vineyard, uh, but has been so instrumental and helpful and believed in Ona's story and so I thank you for working with me to help share Ona's story with everyone and then there's the person who's responsible for me being a historian and that's Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham who's sitting in the front row who I'll never let her go she's she was my undergraduate professor and advisor and she just couldn't shake me she left Penn she went to Harvard I've bugged her there, I still bug her, she still writes letters for me. So I thank you for introducing me to the world of history and also to the importance of telling stories about black women in particular and to adding these stories into the narrative that, uh, that we call American history. So I thank you. So I'll start with a quote um, 
from uh, Chinua Achebe that most of us know, uh, the writer, he wrote, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And I begin with that quote because it sort of explains my professional mission. I write the history of the lion. And I write about phenomenal women who often find themselves written out of history. And today I'll share the story of one such woman. So I'll talk a little bit about her, about the book. I'll read a little bit from the book as well. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions. About 20 years ago, I was completing a bit of research for my first book. And uh, I came across, I was sort of trying to figure out what's life like in the 18th century. And one of the best ways to do that is to read through newspapers. And so I was reading through a newspaper, the sort of 1790s of Philadelphia. And I came across a runaway slave advertisement. And there was a woman named Oni Judge who had run away from the president's house. And I sort of, I stopped in my tracks as I looked at this interview and I thought, wait a minute, so I'm doing the math. 1796, okay, that's George Washington. The president's house was in Philadelphia. And who is this woman, Oni Judge? And what happened to her? And did she make it? Did she make it out of his home, out of Philadelphia? Was she able to find freedom? And I thought, maybe I'll find a way to inc incorporate this story into the first book. And I thought, no, she deserves a book of her own. And so I came back to Ona. I vowed to return and to tell her amazing story that really would lead me on a nine-year trail. It took me nine years to research and write this book. She's one of the most incredible women I've ever encountered in the archives. So let me take you to the 18th century, to Philadelphia, where Ona lived. Spring rain drenched the streets of Philadelphia in 1796. Weather in the city of brotherly love was often fickle at this time of year. Vacillating between extreme cold and oppressive heat, but rain was almost always appreciated in the nation's capital. It erased the putrid smells of rotting food, of animal waste, of filth. That permeated the cobblestone roads of the new nation, it reminded Philadelphians that the long and punishing winter was behind them. Spring rain cleansed the streets and souls of Philadelphians. It brought in optimism and hope and a feeling of rebirth. And in the midst of the promises of spring, Ona Judge, a young black enslaved woman, received devastating news. She learned that she was to leave Philadelphia, a city that had become her home. Judge was to travel back to her birthplace of Virginia and to prepare herself to be bequeathed to her owner's granddaughter. Today I introduce one of the most understudied fugitive slaves in America. At the age of 22, she stole herself literally from the Washingtons forcing the president and his wife to show their slave catching hands. As a fugitive, judge would test the president's will and reputation. The most important man in the nation, heralded with winning the American Revolution, could not reclaim his enslaved woman. Ona Judge did what very few people could do. She beat the president. Judge was never caught. Now, I always sort of talk about the title, Never Caught. I worked with this title for years. Um, and my editor liked the title as well, but not everybody did. Um, there were some concerns, marketing in particular, that the title 
you know, this Erica, you're kind of giving the story away, never caught, you know, well, we know what's going to happen. And my, my response was, well, we, we have other plays, other books that do the same thing. Death of a Salesman, 12 Years a Slave. You know that, you know, somebody's going to die. You know someone's going to be a slave for 12 years. It worked, right? And fortunately, uh, Never Caught has worked as well. But I was adamant to use this title, Never Caught, because the reality was, although we know Ona Judge escapes, and she manages to stay away from the Washingtons, she was never truly free. So I didn't want to use the term free or freedom that didn't seem right with this story or with the story of many others who were fugitives, others who were attempting to live as free people, but the law counted them as something else. Ona Judge, I argue, is a new American hero. An enslaved girl raised at Mount Vernon who once exposed to the ideas of freedom was compelled to pursue it at any cost. This was a woman who found the courage to defy the President of the United States. The wit to find allies, to escape, to outnegotiate, to run, and to survive. Her story is the only existing account of a fugitive once held by the Washingtons. It's the only a fugitive account from any slave in the 18th century from Virginia. Judge's life exposes the sting of slavery and the drive of defiance. She guarded what she called or felt was her freedom every day of her life, never regretting her decision to fight for what she believed to be her right, and that was freedom. Luckily for me, uh, when I began this journey of uncovering Ona's life, uh, she left behind two interviews at the end of her life that shed tremendous light. There were small interviews, but it was enough. And for someone who does 18th and 19th century history, to have something that was the voice of Ona, it was not written by her. Uh, Ona was literate, meaning she could read, but not certain that she could write. So having this interview view from her, uh, or two of them at the end of her life, proved extremely helpful in crafting her narrative. Ona was born um, right around the turn, the beginning of the American Revolution, 1774-ish, we believe. I don't have an exact birth date because Washington did not keep or write, keep a record of the date of the births of his, uh, birth of his slaves. But she's born at Mount Vernon. She's the daughter of an enslaved seamstress by the name of Betty. And what's interesting to think about, uh, you know, this story, although it's a story about Ona Judge, about a fugitive, about a woman who ran from the Washingtons, but it was really an opportunity for me to take Ona's life and allow us to look at how the beginning of the nation appeared through the eyes of the enslaved. So it was telling the story about the founding of the nation, not from founding fathers, but through the people that they claimed as property. And Ona's story gave me the ability to tell this sort of broader narrative about what it meant to be enslaved, what it meant to be free, what it meant to be a fugitive at the end of the 18th and the early 19th century. Uh, Ona's mother was an enslaved, as I said, seamstress. She was technically owned by Martha Washington. Uh, for those of you who don't know, George Washington was Martha's second husband. Uh, her first husband died and left her as a very wealthy um, woman in the Chesapeake. So when George Washington married Martha, he kind of came up with the marriage in terms of, you know, he, he was of sort of middling wealth. Um, she owned thousands of acres of land as well as hundreds of slaves. And so uh, there was always a sort of careful delineation between whose slaves were whose in, in the estate uh, of George and Martha Washington. So Ona's mother was technically owned by Martha not uh, George Washington. Ona's father was a white indentured servant. 
by the name of Andrew Judge. And so I was able to track Andrew Judge and his life, uh, an indentured servant who came from England about a year before Ona was born. He was a tailor. Uh, he was the only person at Mount Vernon with the surname of Judge and the only person in all of Fairfax County with the surname of Judge. And for that reason, I was able to uh, comfortably surmise that this was her father, as well as the description of Ona. Uh, I don't know the nature of the relationship or encounters between Betty and Andrew, but eventually uh, their union, their encounters, whether it was violent or uh, voluntary, produced Ona. And Ona would grow up at Mount Vernon. At the age of 10, she would go up to serve in the mansion house. And in some ways, she managed to become Martha Washington's top slave. I'm still kind of wrestling with the right terminology for that. Uh, people have used other phrases. I'm not quite certain what, actually, how to describe it. But she became Martha's go-to person. And for that reason, in 1789, when Washington was elected the first president of the United States, she was chosen to travel to New York uh, as the Washingtons moved. George and Martha Washington would take seven slaves from Mount Vernon with them. Ona was one of them. And she would be taken from her mother, Betty, and her other siblings that remained in Virginia. And so I'm going to read a bit from the book. I think this moment that George Washington leaves and goes to New York is really important uh, because it's the moment that Ona, uh, for the first time, encounters the North, encounters freedom. And she's also doing it with her mistress, Martha Washington, who was very unhappy about this move to New York. When, when George Washington went to uh, be sworn in and take his oath of office, he was alone. Martha didn't want to go. She didn't want to move. It sounds familiar, right? So um, eventually, Martha would join her husband and she would bring slaves with her. So let me read a little bit from the book about this moment that Ona travels, leaves behind Mount Vernon. The young Ona judge was far from an experienced traveler. The teenager knew only Mount Vernon and its surroundings and had never traveled far from her family and loved ones. For Judge, the move must have been similar to the dreaded auction block. Although she was not to be sold to a different owner, she was forced to leave her family for an unfamiliar destination hundreds of miles away. Judge would have no choice but to stifle the terror she felt and to go on about the work of preparing to move, folding linens, packing Martha Washington's dresses and personal accessories, helping with the grandchildren, were all the tasks at hand, and it wasn't her place to complain or question. Judge had to remain strong and steady, if not for herself, then for her mistress, who appeared to be falling apart at the seams. Like Judge, Martha Washington had no choice about the move to New York. Her life was at the direction of her husband, who was now the most powerful man in the country. Mrs. Washington and Ona Judge may have shared similar concerns, but of course, only Martha Washington was allowed to express discontent and sorrow. Martha Washington was unhappy, and everyone knew it, including her frightened slave. The president's nephew, Robert Lewis, would also soon be made aware of it. When he arrived at the estate on May 14th, things were in disarray. Lewis, who served as Washington's secretary between 1789 and 91, had chosen to escort his aunt and her grandchildren to New York, but was surprised and a bit concerned when he arrived to find a frenzied and hectic scene. Lewis wrote, quote, everything appeared to be in confusion. 
end quote, the manifestation of Mrs. Washington's conflicting feelings. Robert Lewis described the departure which finally took place on May 16th, 1789 as an emotional moment for the slaves and the first lady. He wrote, after an early dinner and making all necessary arrangements in which we were greatly retarded, it brought us to three o'clock in the afternoon when we left Mount V. The servants of the house and a number of the field Negroes made their appearance to take leave of their mistress. Numbers of these poor wretches seemed greatly agitated, much affected. My aunt, equally so. Betty, Ona Judge's mother, must have been one of those agitated slaves. Not only was she losing her 16-year-old daughter, but she was also losing her son, Austin, who would serve as one of the Washington's waiters. Austin's wife, Charlotte, and their children would have joined in the morning. Betty watched her children leave Mount Vernon, a reminder of what little control enslaved mothers had over the lives of their children. If she found any comfort that day, it would have been that brother and sister were traveling together. Austin was older and male and could look out for his younger sister. Still, Betty knew that her relationship with her children would never be the same. And so it's this moment that they leave uh, for New York. And the stay in New York was relatively short, but it was an important moment because it's when Ona sort of for the first time encounters a large number of free black people in the streets of New York. Now there's still a significant number of enslaved people there as well, but it's her first encounter. And she only stays in New York, the nation's capital moves. You know, I've never, uh, you know, I teach, uh, I'll be teaching at Rutgers in the fall, and I've never had this moment where so many students are aware of this kind of early na national period, and it's all because of Lin-Manuel and Miranda, right? So I, I, Lin-Manuel, Miranda, who, and Hamilton, and so like they come and sing the songs, and they know that the nation's capital moved, and I'm like, great, you've made my job easier. Um, I'll take it. And it's when this, the nation's capital moves to Philadelphia uh, that Ona really encounters for the first time a significantly large free black population. There are over 6,000 free blacks. It's the largest black population anywhere with a, a very sort of small number of enslaved people, maybe a hundred. So when Washington brings his slaves to Philadelphia, and the number ticks up, he, it's at nine now, he brings nine people to Philadelphia, they're the oddballs, right? They're in the minority. And in Pennsylvania, the laws had already established that, or begun the dismantling of slavery. And for this reason, when Ona arrives, she's in the minority, but sees what's happening in front of her. There's a huge Quaker presence in Philadelphia that also um, contributes to the freedom of black people. And this law in Pennsylvania, as I said before, helps promote freedom as well. So there's a law that's passed in 1780 and it basically says if you're born on March 1st, 1780 or afterwards, you could be kept as a slave for 28 years. That's a significant amount of time, especially in the early national period. But what it does is make certain that slavery is going to end eventually, gradually. But there's another piece to this law that becomes problematic for George Washington. The law stated that if you were a non-resident and you came to Pennsylvania, you could only keep your slaves with you in that state for six months. And if you stayed longer than six months, your slaves could be set free. So there's a significant amount of letter writing that goes on between George Washington, Martha Washington, and his secretary, Tobias Lear, about this problem. Washington wrote that he wanted to have his slaves moved in and out of the state, and they create a six-month rotation. 
So every six months, the slaves would be sent back to Virginia, or if that was too much of an inconvenience, a quick trip to Trenton would basically restart the clock on slavery for the nine enslaved people with the Washingtons, George wrote, I wish to have it accomplished under the pretext that may deceive both them and the public. And you know, I'm reading through the, his letters and you know, the, that's the moment where I'm like, George, really, you know, really? There's so many servants in Philadelphia, and he, and he wrote frequently about not liking white servants. He, prefer, he preferred his own, Martha said the same. But the lengths to which George and Martha Washington went to hold on to their slaves in a state that had already started to dismantle slavery uh, was startling uh, to me, even as a historian. Ona would live here for seven years. And in 1796, her life would change and would change um, drastically. In February of 1796, a palpable unease in the executive mansion uh, was felt by all who lived there. Ona Judge and her enslaved companions would tread lightly around George and Martha Washington. They were upset. A letter had arrived in, in the, the post from their granddaughter. Eliza Custis, um, who would become Eliza Law. And she was writing a letter to her grandparents, basically informing them that she was going to get married. And um, they didn't know this guy. And he was 20 years older than she. And he was a British businessman who had come to the federal city to try and find a way to, to make money. And he brought with him two of his biracial Indian children. He was a total wild card. The Washingtons had no idea that there was a relationship that that was um, strong and at the point where uh, they were going to marry. And so she wrote to her grandparents asking for their permission. Her father was deceased. Um, she lived with her mother. And the Washingtons, of course, were upset about this. Martha feared that her granddaughter was walking into a situation about which she knew nothing, was too young to be married, and um, for this reason she, she worried. And so I'm reading through some of the, the papers, once again as a, as a historian in the archives, um, I get to read sort of the gossip of the 18th century. So I'm reading through John Adams' letters to Abigail, and he says, oh, and Eliza's about to marry this man who's older, and he's got swarthy children. And so it's this kind of gossip, you know, that he's writing to Abigail, and I'm like, wow, OK, yes, that's, how, that's exactly what people were saying at that moment. And for this reason, Martha is dreadfully upset. And it's only when she comes up with a sort of plan um, to work out her concern for her daughter, a granddaughter rather, uh, that she starts to take, uh, she starts to accept the marriage. She realized that her granddaughter had moved into a situation and uh, the only way she would be able to take care of this situation, to help her granddaughter, was to give Ona Judge to her granddaughter. Now normally when I give this talk, I have an image of Eliza. And it's an image of her like this. <laughs> and she, uh, the story went that uh, he, uh, the, at the time, Gilbert Stewart, who did the portrait, was doing a portrait for George Washington. Eliza had burst into the room and was kind of indignant and had her hands crossed. She was annoyed. And this, I use this image because it tells us a lot about what this transition was going to mean for Ona Judge. Eliza was known for being a sort of volcanic woman. A woman whose temperament no one could sort of understand. And part of that is, you know, 18th century women getting a raw deal for making their own decisions, right? But the other piece, and her, her relatives would say uh, that she was difficult, that she was temperamental. And once Ona found out that she was to become the property of Eliza, she made a decision. She knew that if she returned to Virginia and allowed herself to be given away, that her life would change forever. I'm going to read quickly from another passage in the book. 
about this moment that Ona makes a decision, a decision that uh, alters her life. Judge knew what the future held should she not heed the advice of her free black associates. Quote, she supposed if she went back to Virginia, she should never have a chance to escape, end quote. Once she learned that, quote, upon the decease of her master and mistress, she would become the property of a granddaughter of theirs by the name of Custis, she knew that she had to flee. She imagined that her work for the laws would begin immediately, not after the death of her owners, prompting a fierce clarity about her future and her dislike for Eliza Custis. She said in her interview later in her life, she was determined never to be her slave. Her decision was made. She would risk everything to avoid the clutches of the new Mrs. Law. Judge was well informed and knew that her decision was far more than risky, but still she was willing to face dog sniffing kidnappers and bounty hunters for the rest of her life. Yes, her fear was consuming, but so too was her anger. Judge could no longer stomach her enslavement, and it was the change in her ownership that pulled the trigger on Judge's fury. She had given everything to the Washingtons. For 12 years, she had served her mistress faithfully, and now she was to be discarded like the scraps of material that she cut from Martha Washington's dresses. Any false illusions she had clung to had evaporated and Judge knew that no matter how obedient or loyal she may have appeared to her owners, she would never be considered fully human. Her fidelity meant nothing to the Washingtons. She was their property to be sold, mortgaged, or traded with whomever they wished. And it's upon this moment when Ona sort of realizes that she's going to be given away that she makes the decision to run. Uh, and on May 21st, 1796, while the Washingtons ate their supper, Ona ran off and never returned to Philadelphia. Now, I've just sort of given you the, the sort of beginning of, of Ona's story. Uh, the title of the book is Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave, Ona Judge. And so I haven't given you the second part of the story, which is that relentless pursuit. And I don't do that because I want you to buy the book, right? I want you to go read it and buy the book. But what I think is important is that I argue that the moment that she leaves Philadelphia and I was able to track her from Philadelphia up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where she would live out the next almost half a century of her life as a fugitive, where she would form a family, and where she would spend the rest of her days looking over her shoulder, waiting for the Washingtons or their heir, her heirs to come for her. And it's only at the end of her life where, as a fugitive, uh, she came forward to tell her story. It was very difficult to track her life once she moved to Portsmouth because the most important thing for a fugitive is anonymity. And so she left behind very little purposefully in the way of documentation. But I was able, thank goodness, George kept great notes and wrote lots of letters about Ona Judge and about their constant attempt to reclaim her. What I will say is that the Washingtons would spend the rest of their lives tracking her, looking for her, and when they found her, attempting to reclaim her. And the fact that they couldn't reclaim her had everything to do with Ona's savvy nature, with the good people of New Hampshire, with differing feelings about slavery and freedom, and also with a, a president who was leaving office and didn't have much control over his federal appointees. And, and I think it's, it's sort of an important moment for Ona's story to come forward. I was on a panel yesterday about black women's resistance. Um, 
And I think that her story, Ona's story, gives us this opportunity not just to see, to think about the founding of the nation through the eyes of the enslaved, but this is the moment for a story about a black woman resisting the President of the United States. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, we have about we have about five minutes for for questions. If I, I can yell. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, Erica. Why do you think the Washingtons were so relentless in wanting to? I mean, they could have had any number of slaves, right? Yeah. They could have replaced her easily. But why? Oh no! I mean, why were they just? Yeah, no, I think that's a great, it's usually, usually the question that is sort of attached to that is also what was going on between George and Ona, right? That's, you know, and when I started this process this of, of researching, I thought, okay, I'm going to find, I'm going to be the Annette Gordon-Reed of George Washington, I'm going to find that connection, and I didn't, right? And in some ways, it actually makes the, sh the story stronger, I think. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons that they pursued Ona. The reality was they had over 300 enslaved people back at Mount Vernon. So we know that there were uh, other folks who could step in and serve um, Eliza Custis. And without sort of spoiling um, the book, Martha Washington does just that. She finds someone else, and it's a relative of Ona's who is sent to work for Eliza. Um, I think that. When you have an enslaved person in your home for so many years, they know a whole lot about you. And at this moment, in 1796, George Washington was preparing, Washington was preparing to leave office and was very sort of conscious about image and legacy. And I think that he was concerned about Ona being kind of out there with the ability to tell her own story, um, but was also very conscious of the fact that he did not want to um, go after Ona in a very public way. So what's important is that George Washington uses his appointed officials, the Secretary of the Treasury, a customs collector, to do this attempt to reclaim Ona all in this very discreet fashion. So he's, he's basically breaking the Fugitive Slave Law, which he signs in 1793, which requires attorneys and magistrates. He did none of that. He wanted it done quickly. And I think it was because, in part, of Ona sort of as a loose end, but I think there's something deeper, which is also the feeling of a loss of power and control. That when a slave escapes from their owner, what does that say about the power and control of a slave owner, especially when it's the president of the United States, right? So I think there's, um, and he writes, it, you know, that she was treated like one of the family. We've seen that written before. Um, and so that they were um, upset and angry and felt betrayed by her escape, and they would just have to live with it. <laughs> One more, one more question. Yeah. Yes. Um, what, what were, um, why were the slaves placed by George and Abigail as opposed to their daughter placing with the granddaughter? Why did they place slaves at the granddaughter's home? That's a great question. Um, so Martha Washington was someone who actually lived through great trauma. She lost all of her living children before young adulthood. So she, or rather before they were young adults. So by the time that George Washington became president, her children were all deceased. So she really only had her grandchildren to look to. And the Washingtons actually take two grandchildren with them to live in Philadelphia and New York. So it's funny when we think about, you know, grandparents stepping in to take care of grandbabies, you know, this was happening in the 18th century with the president, right? Because the children were deceased. And so for that reason, uh, Martha really um, had only her grandchildren to look to at this moment in her life. And so they were of extreme importance, and she was raising two of them on her own. So that's why um, Eliza's marriage and her concern that she was making a terrible decision 
led to her giving her the best thing she could give her, the thing that would allow her to live with security and safety, and clearly it also demonstrated a confidence that Martha Washington had in Ona Judge as well, right? So she would give Ona away as a wedding gift to secure her granddaughter, and it's that moment that Ona just simply could not live with. So those people are blabbing on, so we can... We can, we can <laughs> We, we, we have a minute or two, sure. <laughs> it sounds like through your nine years of writing this story that you've made a connection with Ona. Was it emotionally difficult to end this piece of writing? Oh, that's a great question. I was um, talking about what it feels like to e finish a book. And um, yeah, working with w about Ona or on Ona, this is the first summer where I'm not writing something about Ona uh, and bothering Don with edits at, you know, on July 4th in Martha's Vineyard. So um, while I was, it's sort of like what I imagine sending your children to college is like, you know, you know you're going to send them off for, the, for them to meet the world and the world to meet them, but you're, you feel a little grief stricken about them not being in your life the same way. Um, so I don't get to write about her, but clearly I'm able to sort of tell her story and to talk to readers and book clubs about her. And I think that sort of fills, um, fills the void. But for me, I've, I've also really felt like Ona has led this journey. I was sort of the historian in the right place, having done the right work and kind of history before to be able to tell this story. So I kind of, I don't take but so much credit because I'm the vessel telling her story and allowing her story to become a part of, of the American narrative. I, I do have news for you. The kids come back for you to do the laundry. <laughs> uh, Ona's not coming they, back they for me to do laundry. <laughs> they, they never go away. <laughs> Awesome story. Can you tell us a little bit about the nature of the two interviews that you said you got? Sure. Yes. So there were two interviews, one that appeared in the Granite Freeman, which was an abolitionist newspaper from New Hampshire in 1845. Uh, and then the second interview, which appeared on New Year's Day of 1847 in the most well known abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator, right? So uh, we at the, it's clear that by the end of her life, she's in her mid 70s, um, she is being looked to um, as someone who can speak to kind of the evils of slavery under the first president of the United States. And that's one of the things that's so fascinating about Ona's life is that it begins with the American Revolution, right? And sort of ends, she dies in 1848 in February. And it ends right at the sort of beginnings of the, the sort of peak of abolitionist movement and rhetoric. And while I'm not certain she would have called herself an abolitionist, right? Clearly her, uh, her life, her life story becomes a part of it, becomes a part of that movement. And the, the interviews are kind of funny. I mean, she kind of explains exactly how she ran off. And um, she's careful not to list the names of um, the free blacks who help her. She says that there are free blacks who help. And in the book, I sort of suggest who that probably was, who they were. Um, but she gives us the name of the ship captain. John Bowles, who ferried her away to New Hampshire. And what I was able to do with that one little name was to be able to track him as a sea captain and to follow, to look through the logs of uh, New in the, the ports of New Hampshire and Philadelphia. And he was indeed on his ship, the Nancy, in Philadelphia in May of 1796 and back in Portsmouth by early June. So it's those little kind of threads that historians look for in two relatively short interviews um, from Ona. She also kind of, she takes a couple of jabs at the president. She does say, you know, uh, yeah, they call themselves Christians, but I didn't really see him pray. You know, she, she you know, she, she takes a few liberties with her 
feelings about um, about George and mother, but it's it's clear it's a very there's a very religious um, component to uh, the interviews, and she says it's because of her ability to escape that she's baptized, that she meets God really for the first time, and so it's clear that her interviews are being um, used in this sort of uh, the peak of of abolition and the abolitionist movement. Okay, this will be really the last question, okay. sir. Um, trying to remember the disposition. Yeah. Trying to remember the disposition of George and Martha's slaves when they pass on, and and but I think that they free some of them, I think. But uh, but at any rate, what whatever happened to them, I wonder if. Um, this experience with whom the judge do you think influenced whatever their mm. decision making was I think in that, that regard? yeah that's a great um, question so one of the things about George Washington and doing this research was that it's very clear that he was somebody that over time became um, uncomfortable with slave ownership. He was born into a slaveholding family, inherited slaves at a young age as a young boy, purchased slaves throughout most of his adulthood, but had, you know, conversations with people who said, George, you know, the Marquis de Lafayette was like, George, okay, slavery, come on. We just had the American Revolution, like freedom. And, and there are moments where Washington writes about his discomfort and says that he wishes to, quote, get quit of his Negroes, right? And, but he never does while he's alive. What's interesting is that George Washington and Martha Washington never had biological children of their own. George had no biological children. And I think this is important because at the end of Washington's life, he changes his will. And his will states that upon the death of Martha, that his slaves were to be emancipated. And so uh, Martha, who didn't want to sleep with one eye open for the rest of her life, because she understood the only thing between these people's freedom was her life, right? She set them free. Right? She said, oh, I'll do this early. You needn't wait until I die, right? <laughs> so she sets them free, um, but never sets anyone free that she owns. So it's a study in contrast when we think about a marriage, you know, Mar George and Martha Washington, and George Washington, who I say does, does in death what he could not do while he was alive, in that he emancipates his slaves. Martha does no such thing. And so there's some that argue, well, you know, her estate was supposed to be passed down to her grandchildren, and so she couldn't alter the will. Well, she altered George's will, right? She set his slaves free early. And she also purchased at least one slave of her own that wasn't passed down from her first husband and he's not set free either. So what I was able to do was to track where all of these people went after George and Martha died, and all of Martha's slaves went off to her grandchildren. Nobody was emancipated, while George Washington's slaves were. So this was just fabulous. For those of you who... Thank you. Thank you.